Hey everybody, welcome to episode 19 of Satellite 664. I'm uh, one of your two co-hosts, Kaz Tagian, and as always I'm joined by uh, Mr. Steve Lutby Newhouse, and our friend of the show is back, he's back, Matthew Ward, Mr. Matthew Hi. Ward. Hi all. How are you, brother? Good, man. How are you guys? Well, all good, mate. All good. well awesome. you, you and I are in uh, lockdown. You and I are in this uh, totalitarian lockdown at the moment. So, uh, Loopy, are you actually getting out, out and about? Yeah, I went for a long walk yesterday. My legs are suffering now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm lucky enough to uh, I'm lucky enough to live by the beach. So the beach is ah, the yes. Week, so I was, um, Went down to the beach today. It was a beautiful afternoon, you know. Yes. I feel sorry for the guys up in the suburbs. You know? yeah, yeah. So for those who don't know, I'm I'm in the northeastern suburbs of Melbourne, in in, in the midst of suburbia, um, and uh, our brother Matthew Ward is uh, free. He's he's <laughs> by the coast, by the beach, um, living living the life. And uh, oh god, anyway. Gentlemen, um, we, we've been working up to this show, this particular episode, for a, a while, for quite a long time, because um, we're going to go back to and cover uh, in depth uh, a very important era of the band, um, and an era of the band which sort of personally is, is very important to me on several levels. Um, I mean, I was already a fan from sort of 83, but... Power Slave sort of changed things for me, and um, I, it, I guess personally, my fandom turned into an obsession around that 84, 85 era. So we're going to talk a little bit about Power Slave, the album, you know, come out with some really interesting tidbits. I mean, we just discovered some phenomenal information just in, the, in our little pre-show meeting, <laughs> so... Yes, which we're all still spinning out over, to be honest. And uh, then we're going to talk about the tour. We're going to tell the story of that era through the merchandise. And uh, you're going to love this. So, uh, gentlemen, let's kick it off. Power Slave, um, released September the 3rd, 1984. Uh, recorded at Compass Point Studios in the Bahamas. <laughs> Mr. Newhouse, Mr. Newhouse, you, uh, you were present. You were there. You were... You I, was, were the, I was just thinking, uh, uh, they released the album in September 84. I actually left, the, well, quit the band, or left them exactly a month before. It was exactly a month before the album came out. That, that was my demise. <laughs> <laughs> so Yes, I was there. Yeah, and, and you saw a lot of things. You saw basically Derek Riggs uh, unveil the canvas with the Aces High artwork. Um, yeah, he, he started work on it there. Um, he was having a problem because he, he uses uh, an air, air spray, like a spray gun, for the, like some of the paintwork, like some of the finer bits and pieces. But he found the uh, humidity was leaving the paint wet and he, he couldn't work under those, those um, conditions. So he packed up and went back to London. He was, he was probably only, I mean, we were there for two months, but Derek was probably only there three weeks maximum, I would have thought. Loopy, did, did Derek do the, the the actual front and back cover artwork whilst he was at Compass Point as well, or was that done in London later on? What, for... Well, the Power Slave. Yeah, cover. yeah, exactly. Uh, no, that was all done back in London. Hmm. Um... It I mean, all the... he, he, he showed he showed me because I, I took the photo of the um, the the front of the picture disc for Ace's height, uh, but also he'd, he'd already done the the B side, you know, with the plane spiraling. Mm. Um, yeah, he'd already done that. He showed me that as well, but I didn't get a photo of it. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's all good. So look. A lot of the stories about what went on at Compass Point is in your book, it's in detail, and we actually covered it on the very, very first episode of this podcast over a year ago, so we won't really go into that. But just one thing, what 
based on what you remember, what was the routine? What was the daily routine? I mean, what time did the guys get up? What time did they head into the studio? When did they record tour? It wasn't really a routine. Um, I mean, because of the, the amount of late nights we used to have, you wouldn't see the band surface much before two o'clock. Um, if we were up earlier, it was because Harry sort of took us on his bloody route march. Um, it's, it's not bubble. Um, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, there wasn't much of a routine. You know, they'd, they'd get into the studio any time after two, um, as long as they were all up and ready for it. But of course, I mean, Bruce... Did he go and record his vocals earlier? He did he went in and recorded his vocals really early on, didn't he? And then just then got out of there. Or? No, his vocals were left pretty much to, to the end because yeah, you, right, you, okay. need, you need at least a lot of the, the, the the basics. Yeah, yeah, yeah just like, like a sort like of bass, backing bass and drums. Yeah, bass and drums will go in, uh, and they will have like one guitar sort of playing along with them, so they they get their bit right, and then like the two guitars will go in and record. And by that time, you can bring Bruce in because he, he's then got something to, to mess about with. And then all the fiddly bits afterwards, like guitar solos, etc., et that's all done afterwards. And then once once we, we'd finished, um, we sort of packed up and then the, the, the tapes were then taken to the studio um, in New York and finished off there. So was, was Bruce around from the beginning of the recording or did he turn up after a couple of weeks once there were some tracks sort of getting laid down or...? Um, do, 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 do. I think we all flew out together. Yeah, right. Awesome. They were there together um, because Bruce, um, I think one of the interviews he gave, in fact, I think it's on the the history of Iron Maiden Part 2 DVD, he does say that he was quite bored and he's sort of waiting and waiting for everybody else to do their thing. Um, so I think he came in a little bit yeah, later. I mean, there, was a, there was a few times when the, you know, the rest of the band would be in the studio and Bruce would say to me, Go and get a pizza. You know, and like we'd jump in the car and I'd, I'd go off and have a pizza with him. <laughs> it's just what we did. <laughs> oh, brilliant. So, yeah, released 3rd of September 84. Um, and what a time uh, t- for an album to come out. And not only come out, but it, it roared with a vengeance into the UK charts and hit number two. And the only thing that prevented it from going number one was actually a compilation album, which really, in years later, wouldn't have really qualified for, for charting based on that methodology. So number two is very, very impressive. And the reason why it's impressive, have a look at what the competition was in the music industry at that point. I mean, it was, let's talk about 19... No, we're talking about 1984 here. Uh... Look who, look who was big. Culture Club, Wham, Prince, Cindy Lauper, Nick Kershaw, um, you know, Frankie oh, Goes to Hollywood, <laughs> Spandau Ballet. I mean, I mean, Spandau the, Ballet. The list just goes on and on. And for our band, our band to uh, roar into number two on the home charts and number 12, I think, on the US charts is just brilliant and it's testimony to how strong the album is and i guess on the rock scene on the hard rock scene the um the whole la sunset strip scene was exploding um you know you had your bands like wasp motley crew rat you know Dokken, just really i remember remember being in the uh hotel the lafayette hotel in um fort lauderdale when the band were allegedly re- like rehearsing the album. Um, it, I mean, the, the gear was all set up in this tiny little club, and I've forgotten the name of it, um, next to a bar. The band spent most of the time either in the bar or they were flying off doing interviews all over the place. And it just left me sort of sitting, sitting there with the gear all day long, you know, just in case someone decided to come in and nick it because the doors were open. <laughs> um, but, but what they did have was this... Um, one of those um, sort of LED rolling displays like running across the back. And I figured out how to actually put up Iron Maiden so that it just keeps scrolling across. Yeah, like... <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
while um while I was at the hotel, um, MTV, I mean, it was quite a quite a big thing then. You know, it was becoming sort of massive. And the two two bands that you've just mentioned, Motley Crue and Rat, um, they were on play probably every hour. Yeah. The, the round and round, and um, oh, I've forgotten the, the crew track. Uh, would have been Looks That Kill. No, it might have been another one. Well, we're talking about 84, so it was Too Young to... Oh, oh, the, could have been Too Young yeah, to Fall in Love. Too, that's it, yeah. Too, too Young, young to Fall in Love. Yeah. yeah, and they, they were on constant every hour, guaranteed. Yeah. And, and, and mm. Cindy Lauper. Of, well, God, <laughs> for that squeaky voice she had. Um, and But we should actually add, all those bands that we just mentioned ended up opening for Maiden on the World Slavery Tour. So right, Mot- yeah. Motley Crue did the entire European tour and, uh, you know, Rat, Twisted Sister, Except, Queensryche, uh, Wasp were pretty much 85, on the 85 tour, um, opening for Maiden. So, I mean, imagine... Imagine being, you know, for the for the American fans, for the US fans. Imagine going to a gig and having Twisted Sister open and then come Maiden. I mean, a hell of a bill, hell of a bill. I mean, I wasn't there, so I don't know. Although I do have this huge gig list in front of me, I haven't really studied it. But was it only ever one band opening for Maiden? Because uh, when, when Maiden first went out, there, there was sort of two support bands and then the main act. Yeah, so I can't, look, I can't speak for every every tour of that, the US tour, uh, sorry, every show of the US tour, but uh, I know in, in there was a stretch where they had three bands on the bill. So I know uh, in... You know in 83, at the US tour in 83, there was at least two bands before. Yeah, Maiden. that's right. So yeah. Fargo, Fargo, South Dakota, 1985, they had yet a band called Mama's Boys first, then I think Rat or Accept, I can't remember, and and then uh, then Maiden came on. So yeah, you're right. I think the the there was that uh, sort of practice of having sort of three three bands on the bill. But yeah, as I said, imagine. Uh, I mean, what would you give? What would you, you would kill to have these days to go to, to a show and see a bill like that? You know, it's been a been been a long time since I've been to a, a gig and seen bands of that sort of stature all on the one bill together. Um, so yeah, we call them we call them festivals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I hate... just, just found just found two shows, Evansville. Uh, obviously in the US, it was accepting Why on Earth? And at Sacramento, before the last show, in fact, with the last show, San Jose, Sacramento and Irving uh, was Accept and Wasp. Oh, Accept and Wasp at Irvine. Wow. 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 Incredible. Accept are a great band. Yeah. So, so the album comes out in that climate. Um, and I, the... 12 year old me looked at that album cover and was yeah was was just absolutely gobsmacked by what I was seeing um, that um, I mean that Egyptian artwork <clears throat> is probably in my opinion you know their best album cover maybe on par with somewhere in time um, so so what Derek actually did what Derek Riggs did is build a or not build he or he constructed a a general schema of a Egyptian monument. Now, in e- in ancient Egypt, there was no single monument with a pyramid, uh, you know, a colossal statue, and and sort of chiselled out figures all together. What he actually did, he took the pyramids of Giza, um, combined it with the, you know, the the monument of uh, Ramesses the second at Abu Simbel. And the Sphinx, and he sort of put them all together and built this imaginary um, monument, which, but, you know, to me, it, it just looks absolutely incredible. I mean, I... It's mind-blowing. And yeah. I was always blown away by the fact that Derek would paint them the same size as the album cover. I've got that was the size I've of the painting, 12 inches by 12 inches. Correct. To get that amount of detail in there is just... Correct. 
unbelievable. Yeah, correct. And uh, I mean, I remember as a as a kid, you know, you'd I'd play the vinyl, and I mean that that album goes for fifty minutes, and for fifty minutes, you'd I'd just be just be pouring over the cover, yeah. staring at every single detail of it. The only thing that wasn't Egyptian is some graffiti on the hieroglyphs. What a load of crap! You know that sort yeah, of. Yeah. You know, so, Jones was here, yeah, so you still had that yeah, Monty bollocks. Python, yeah. Bollock, yeah, <laughs> bollocks. You'd still have that sort of British humour that came out yeah. in, in 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 sort of combined with the world of ancient Egypt, which was great. But and ironically, as you've said many times before, Loopy, we think it's a concept album, but it's clearly not. I mean, there's only one song about Egypt on yeah. the whole album. You know, yeah, I've, I've often wondered, you know, why they they went. With that that kind of cover because it 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 just screams Egypt at you. But but look, I mean the, the title track is just such an epic song. I mean it it all fits and it all worked for you know yeah. whatever. And with hindsight, it was an amazing choice, fantastic choice. Yeah, so and the point, of, point of Kaz made in, in his pre pre production was that yes, it is an absolutely British album. Mm-hmm. It's a very British album when you sort of look at the songs on their own. I mean, you've, I mean, the opening yeah. track is about the Battle of Britain with the Spitfire pilots. Um, yeah. Then you've got um, Rum the Ancient Manor itself. I mean, the poem by you know the, the English poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And whilst we're on Rum of the Ancient Mariner, w- let's let's f- clarify once and for all who whose voice does the narration in that middle part. It's a rhetorical question. We already know it, but there's such controversy about it. Is years ago I heard it was there was a rumor that it was actually Bruce, because Bruce has done training in Shakespearean theatre whilst he was at university, and um, obviously as an actor, he has that ability to use an actor's voice uh, to mould it into different, uh, you know, ways. But um, we've got the answer. So, who was it? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I, I've asked the man himself. I spoke to, uh, well, I sent Steve a text message um, asking about the uh, who did the voice because I thought it, you know, it might be might be Bruce, as you said. Um, Steve's response was no, it was a professional voiceover chap. So I said, well, does the guy have a name? And Steve said, not sure. We tried to get Ralph Richardson, but couldn't get him, so we got someone that sounded like him. Wow. There's your answer. Well, there you go. So it wasn't Bruce Dickinson. It wasn't Richard Burton. It wasn't the other gentleman you just named. It was a random voiceover guy who we'll never know and we'll never get him on the show. So. Yeah. Amazing. He, he's missing out on royalties. You know, <laughs> something, something wrong now. Okay. And um, the the actual inner sleeve is is in, is interesting because again the the theme of Egypt is just all over it. The you know our boys our guys are in what looks like um, the king's tomb. So it was as if Howard Carter in 1922 excavated the, excavated the tomb of Tutankhamun, and um, the boys are there with all the, the you know the, the like the gilded little figures and um, a, a whopping sarcophagus. And out of the three of us on this show, one of us was actually there, weren't they? Yeah, it's fake news. It's, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the picture to, uh, just behind Kaz there shows the five members of the band with the sarcophagus in front of them. The, the actual picture with the, uh, the backdrop behind was taken in one of, the, uh, one of the rooms that the guys were staying in at Compass Point. The photo was taken by Ross Halkin. And I was standing about three feet away from Adrian when that photo was taken. The sarcophagus was added after. And from 1984, you know, long before Photoshop, I think that's a great job. Unbelievable. Now, it's just mind blowing. That only came out during our pre show meeting. I mean, Lupi, I've known you all this time. And we, how many hours of conversations have we had? And yet in a pre, pre-show pre meeting, that just randomly came out. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Incredible. It's, it's, it's been a long time since I've actually seen that poster because you don't normally sit there. No, I don't normally sit there. I've, uh, I normally sit about two metres that way. Um, so 
I thought I thought we'd mix it up because uh, you know it gets a little. The, the actual backdrop was a canvas. It was it was put up on a on a pole. It was stretched from one side of the room to the other. <laughs> Oh, wow. You are shattering the yeah. illusions of that 12-year-old boy in 1984 <laughs> who thought that this was in an Egyptian tomb. It's, I mean, I thought the whole album was recorded in Ramesses II's tomb. So <laughs> now, now as a as a it sounds like it as a man approach <laughs> yeah, as a man approaching 50 years old, um, it's, it's just the reality set, settling in. So. Incredible, Too absolutely amazing. incredible. That's what I've got. Well, in fact, I'm just getting rid of all my secrets. <laughs> well, let's la- let's uh, launch into the tour. So, um, pre pre production was at uh, Fort Fort Lauderdale, and again, you were there, sir. And yep. um, the actual tour started in um, in August of 1984. Um, uh, really, let's say it. Face it the warm up gigs were behind the Iron Curtain. They were in in um, Poland, Hungary, uh, Yugoslavia, and um, that's all very well documented on um, on the Behind the Iron Curtain video, which, which everyone's seen, I'm sure. Um, now, what I guess what the tour is very well no- known for is um, it, it was the longest tour they, they've done. I mean, a hundred and, mm. was it 190 gigs? 190 gigs in 13 months, um, of which, by the I way, we, hmm? I printed off. I printed off the entire gig list on A4 sheets. Can you see that? Yeah, All I can see is Eddie, Eddie's face. Eddie now, yeah, yeah. We're <laughs> seeing that. The no. white, the white takes the background. Yeah, the white. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, anyway, eight A4 sheets. From top to bottom, it's, you know, this is like fuck me hell. Yeah, I'm running out of ink. I'm running out of paper. Yeah, hundred hundred and eighty nine gigs. Um, we have oh, thankfully, yeah. thankfully, they professionally filmed uh, the two of the Los Angeles gigs. They um, recorded them as well as the Hammersmith gigs, um, which ended up on side four. But uh, and we have. Mm, at last count about 93 or 94 audio bootlegs out of the um out of the uh well the the tour which is incredible i have i have 86 of them yeah well i need i just need a few more i just i just need a small handful and i'm i'm working on them so uh yeah (laughs) but they're very interesting bootlegs are great because um you get to hear. I mean, look, live after death is a very nicely polished, uh, uh, sh- you know, recording. You, you, know, you want to hear what it was like being there. You know, the mistakes, um, Bruce's rants. I mean, he made some funny rants, which we're going to talk about in a in a bit. But yes, there's there's about ninety four existing audio bootlegs, and um, yeah, I got a few of them. So, <laughs> so, but. <Phew>. but, but <laughs> But but now, Loopy, you were at Hammersmith. You were at Hammersmith in '84. Did you know it was going to be recorded, or did you turn up and just see the trucks? Um, I had no idea uh, beforehand because I was then working with Stage Miracles, the local crew company, hmm. and we were called in to to, to work with Maiden. I do remember the trucks being parked down the side, just around the corner um, from. Is that just right around the corner from Queen so Queen Caroline Street? Side of, uh, literally opposite the stage door, down the alley, down the side. Yeah, yeah. Because there's uh, a main road on the left, and then there's a suburb, and just as a like a back street suburban road on the right. So, so you were that the 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 truck was on that side, was it? If, if you're looking at the front of the building, yeah, you've got um, you've got sort of truck width alleys that go round to the back, and it was parked down the one on the right hand side. Mm. Opposite the stage door, because it obviously, you know, people need to change mics or whatever. It was the shortest distance. Yeah, very... I think I actually actually went in there once. Just to like, be nosy. I went in there with Doug. But, um, yeah, Doug, uh, all right, yeah, they've been recording. I had no idea it was for a live album. You know, nowadays, maybe we called everything. 
Yeah, so, um, in fact, I'm trying to think back to 83. I don't remember recording anything on 83. Only what uh, Doug did through the desk. Through the desk, yeah. yeah. So and so that that obviously ended up being on side four of um, of uh, Live After Death, and that particular night they did some extra songs that weren't part of the regular set list. Um, Fan of the Opera being one of them. Um, so now um. On my list. All right, so well, let's um, look. Let's get into the story of the tour now. The obviously we've laboured the point that it was a very long tour and um, it really affected the guys. I mean, Bruce, Bruce, very, very widely documented. He was burnt out. He was tired. He wanted to pack it up and go home, um, and that sort of was the catalyst to them taking you know some some time off after the tour, which which they hadn't done previously. Um, I heard that apparently Rod turned out and said to the band afterwards that they wanted to continue. He wanted them to go back to America. Oh, correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, correct. And um, the band basically said no. They, they just said no. Enough's enough. Uh, after the 13th month, they all sort of protested and said no. Um, and you, could, you can get some insight on the state of mind they were in. I mean, Adrian has been quoted as saying that he he sort of lost a year of his life, um, sort of didn't know who he was after a while. And there's that famous story that he went to visit his parents in London after the tour and he knocked on the wrong house. Um, yeah, so I, I, again, I, I just don't understand that. You know, if you're going to turn up at your own house, why do you have to knock? Why don't you have a key? And was he living at his parents' house? Is that the point? Like he's... He went to visit his parents. He's forgotten. He still where was. Yeah, he was still living at, living at home at the time. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> things, things have changed now, but um, yeah, I'm sure he was. Uh, I ran out of that time. Steve, Steve was living in a house. He um, he'd only just got hold of the the shearing hall, but prior to that, he was living in a quite a nice house. You know, sort of two up, two down, um, in um, just around the back of uh, Redbridge um, Underground Station. Well, wow. going around there and playing pool on his pink pool table. Yeah, pink, <laughs> pink, pink pool table. I've never even didn't even know they bloody exist. He's, he's, he's still got it. Who? The one in the pub, Harry. He's, he's still got the pink pool table. Yeah, it's the one he has in his bar. We've got to get the pool. We've got to get the pool table on the show one day, and you, you, you can carry it. <laughs> the tour is also very interesting for another reason in may of 85 um i think just after they played um here uh dave and adrian just took a few days off broke from the tour <clears throat> and went uh, and joined a star-studded lineup of other metal artists and they recorded a charity song for um, what was happening in the world at that time, which was the Ethiopian famine. So for those who were too young to remember or weren't born, um, in 84, the British sort of pop scene got together and re recorded um, a song called uh, Do They Know It's Christmas Time? And, um, and the Americans did one as well called We Are The World. Or, we Are The World. Yeah. yeah, or USA for Africa, I think. I think it was, and I, I remember at the time, I vividly remember at the time listening to the metal shows on the radio and fans were ringing up and saying, well, you know, when are, what about us? You know, we like these outcasts, when are we going to sort of contribute? And in May of 85, and it was a really star-studded list. I mean, everybody, everybody that was anybody from the metal world was there, um, and yeah, they got together. They they called the lineup Here and Aid, and they recorded the song Stars, which for some was it written by Dio? Did Dio write it? Yeah. Was he the instigator? Yeah. So Dio wrote it. Dio opened the, the actual song. Yeah, mm. actually, he sang, he sang most of it. And I mean, it's everybody sings on. It. I mean, you know, Jeff Tate of Queensrÿche sang on it. 
um, Dio sang a lot on it, Don, Don Dawkins sang on it, and Dave and Adrian played the guitar solos, or part of the guitar solos. So um, Vivian Campbell played the solos, uh, George Lynch of Dokken, uh was playing. It, it really was a who's who. And if you watch the full extended video, uh, Dave, and, Dave and Adrian are there, you know, sort of all talking about their guitars and then playing their guitars uh, uh, during the solo. So, so that was that's something that's something that's often um, well, what, what over. What me more than anything is you got the, the two actors from um, from uh, Spinal Tap <laughs> trying to take it very very seriously, <laughs> and it's like fuck off, guys. <laughs> <laughs> And for reasons that I, to this day, cannot understand, that song was released a year later. So it, it came out in sometime in 86. And I think the fa African famine must have been over by then because uh, no one really cared. But um, <laughs> that, 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 I mean, that's probably it. I mean, all about the, like, the famine because they couldn't grow anything. Didn't they get floods shortly after that? And yeah, they did. They did. So... <laughs> But hey, look, look, you know. Bring it down, just beat me a bit harder. Yeah, that's all right. We're proud of it. We're look, proud of our our genre and our guys. You know, they 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 stepped up to the plate. So interesting. Now let's um, Matthew Ward. Let's uh, let's go through the uh, let's go through the tours. Let's go through the let's tell the story of the tour through the tour shirts and the merch. So. Um, you've got the floor, my friend. You've got the uh, the proceedings. Uh, go for it. All right. Well, well, let's start with the uh, the release of the album. Obviously, Power Slave goes to number two in the UK charts. And as you've mentioned before, there was a compilation album that was released that prevented Power Slave reaching number one. Now, that compilation album was called Now That's What I Call Music, and it was released by EMI, Maiden's own label. So it was Maiden's own label that prevented Power Slave from reaching number one, which is ridiculous, right? Why didn't they just wait another couple of weeks, two or three weeks, give Power Slave the number one spot, then release the next uh, the next chapter in your chart-topping range of compilation albums, which was going to be a guaranteed number one anyway. So they could have just waited a few weeks, given Power Slave its glory. As it was, that's history. That's how it was. Power Slave relegated to number two. So the story goes uh, for this particular shirt that Maiden, the Maiden camp was so pissed off, so angered by that move by EMI, they had this little simple but brutal shirt made up that reads, Power Slave, now that's what I call fucking music. And obviously made just for band, crew members, the Maiden inner circle only. And I'd like to think they may have, you know, slipped one out to some of the EMI executives as well just to let them know what they were feeling and um, super, super rare shirt defines and an awesome captures the sentiment and the emotion of that moment in the maiden history. And look, and look, shirt nerd fact number one for tonight, maiden actually did a reprint of this shirt. I'm not sure if it was the year after or the same year, but they kind of backed off a little bit and they edited it down so that instead of the word fucking, they just put um, a hyphen or asterisk or whatever, K-I-N music. So it became, instead of, you know, that's what I call fucking music, it was just, that's what I call can music. I, so it kind of took the edge off it, made it a bit more humorous. And it sort of took away from that original vicious sentiment that they had on that shirt. Yeah, but the message is still very clear, that's isn't right. it? That's right. The message yeah, survives. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. And interestingly... Um, Bruce really did have a, a real gripe, a real chip on his shoulder about um, all that whole thing. And, um, uh, you know, all the other art, pop artists in the industry who were sort of competing with them. I mean, and this is why I love bootlegs, because you, you these are stuff that you hear that you don't, you know, you don't get to hear in the, in the mainstream. But on the UK tour, every single show that they played... Before Rama the Ancient Mariner, he would have, he would go on this hilarious rant. It was about a you know minute, two minute long rant, and he'd say, you know, we have an album called Power Slave, which is number two, 
and he made a a very uncharitable comment about Boy George. Um, well, Boy George's rear end, um, <laughs> which in this political his age of political correctness, so uh, we probably shouldn't mention. I mean, I'm not politically correct at all, but I don't want to offend anybody. So did he, did he ever mention? Did he ever mention the EMI compilation on any of those? No, shows no, like no, no. I think what he said is, um, well, to get a you know top ten album in this country, you need to dress like a woman, you know, like Boy George, and that should have him, you know, looking back up his ass or something to that effect. And he said it was in, he, huh? Was he ever as venomous in other countries? Or no, was it just no. The UK, that he was more just the UK shows. Yeah. So. Uh, just the UK show. So the, you know, all the shows that they had in Germany, obviously the Iron Curtain, you know, Holland, uh, everywhere else, the US, no. He never went on that rant. That rant was specifically for the shows that, that they did in the UK, in, in England, Scotland and Wales. So, um, uh, it, look, it's it's a hilarious rant when you if you get a chance to sort of listen to any of those it's it's a great rant. I think they've. I mean, it's always been a us against them type mentality. I mean, he did a similar rant on the Seven Sun tour as well. And instead of Boy George this time, he had Kylie Minogue in his sights. So, um, but well, that's another show, isn't it? So <laughs> it's funny because you think about the shirt that I was just describing. You think that uh, Rod Small would have, would have made everyone wear the shirt in all the, all the photo shoots afterwards, but it's actually. I've only ever seen the one group shot of the band with someone in the band, which happens to be Nico, wearing that shirt. I've seen Adrian wear it. I've seen a photo of Adrian. Adrian's wearing the second one that's like the edited Oh, down. yes, he is. You see the... Yes, he is. Yes, he is. The edited yes, words, he is. Yeah. Actually, in, uh, I think in one of the shows, I can't remember which one, uh, Rod Smallwood must have had a word to Bruce because when Bruce was about to you know, assassinate Boy George in that rant... Um, he goes, ah, oh, my manager's told me I shouldn't say anything, but ah, oh, stuff it. I'm just going to say it. And he just, he just <laughs> let, 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 so Luby, you never worked with Boy George, did you? No, last time I saw him, when I, it, yeah, in fact, yeah, the last time I actually saw Boy George was, um, I was working for somebody at, um, Wembley Arena, the old Wembley Arena, and they used to have, uh, um, the toilets were sort of quite open. Oh no! <laughs> you got your vinyls all down one wall, and you got the cubicles like behind. And I finished having a piss and turned around, and there's Boy George sliding down the wall. He was just so <laughs> off his tits. Yeah. That's, that's the last time I saw him. And that was about 1980. That would have been about 85. All right, let's. Uh, I think we should. I think we should and move now, on. Now he's out here hosting the Voice. You know? Yes, his voice is hosting the Voice. He he calls himself the Queen of England. Is that is that is an apt term for him? Do you think? No. I mean, <laughs> we've got a queen. Yeah, we don't need another. No. Fact, over over here, he doesn't say. Doesn't mention it at all. No. I've never heard him use that term over here. No. I'd I'd love to ask him, I don't know if he ever came became aware of Bruce Bruce's rants in uh, in eighty four. But hey, that was thirty six years ago. I mean, he probably probably wouldn't care. In, in, in all honesty, I'm surprised that Boy George is still alive. I think we all are. To, to, I mean, to after after what I saw that night, you know, it, hmm. yeah. Let's <laughs> leave Boy George and continue with uh, the tour. Um, where are we going next? Uh, so obviously, first point of call for the tour was obviously behind the Iron Curtain. Yes. Um, as you mentioned, famously filmed for the uh, the uh, MTV documentary Behind the Iron Curtain at the time. And so the first shirt we're going to see is the first edition of the European tour shirt, which shows uh, the Iron Curtain dates on the top of the listing. Um, unknown as to whether they actually sold this shirt on those dates, it was probably more... Uh, we don't know unless, you, unless we can find someone who's at those dates to confirm what was for sale, if anything. Uh, probably more likely sold than the European dates immediately following. And again, shirt nerd fact number two 
there's actually a couple of versions of this shirt. Uh, the more common version has the dates in white with a green outline, whereas this one has them in green with a white outline and shows five dates at Hammersmith, which uh, was ultimately changed to four. So whether it was a misprint or it was originally meant to be five and they rescheduled, who knows, but it's another hard version of a shirt to find from this part of the tour. Well, knowing what we know about misprints and, and quite a few of those, or some shirts in that era were mis misprinted, I wouldn't surprise me if that actually was an error. But then again, then again, I mean, they were so popular at home and they did play almost a week That's of right. shows in, 19, in 1986. Maybe they did have five shows booked in, you know, but they had to cancel. Who knows, maybe Boy George had a, had a show. I've actually, got, I've actually <laughs> got five, five London shows on the list that I downloaded. Yeah, but it was four. In reality, it was four, so. Okay. Yeah. So, still, so still, while we're on the, uh, the Iron Curtain, uh, tour. The next shirt is the uh, the Meteorolites crew shirt. Meteorolites being a maidens lighting uh, company and built their lighting rigs all the way through the 80s. And if you see the original extended footage of Behind the Iron Curtain, uh, the documentary, you see the boys in the band and the crew members wearing this particular shirt. Um, and obviously the front has the Meteorolites logo and the back has the Maiden European Tour 84. Another awesomely 80s sky blue with, with, with a dark blue collar and another really super hard shirt to find. Loopy, tell us about the um, how that company, Meteorlite company, fit in with Maiden. Um, to be perfectly honest, I'm not really sure uh, where they, how it all came about. Um, I know they were based in a little place in Hertfordshire called Bulldog, which is near Hitchin. Um, it just so happened that um, they knew Charlie Cale, who used to do the stage sets. And that's how we got to know Charlie, and that's how the stage sets all came about. Um, but what used to happen was that um, Dave would come up with, Dave Lights would come up with a design, and Meteor Lights were quite happy to, to build it. It started off very, very small. Um, we had um, what they call a back truss, which is like four sections of 10 feet long, so 40 foot across at the back. Um, and once that was hoisted up, lamps would be hung all the way across. Like, I think it was just like one row, so it was quite like a few, very sort of few lights at the back. And then at the sides, they used to have these uh, towers that were like sort of um, like gas operated. So you like you put the gas in, you pump it up, and turn the gas off, so the lights actually stayed up the sides. That's how it all started. And then you get to got stages like um, like the power slave, which was absolutely massive, but it was still all done by meteorites. You know, they supplied all the equipment. If they didn't have it, they'd borrow it. Um, there, there, there was there's two or three sort of big companies in the UK, or well, back then there was that could uh, supply like the same equipment. Unless they had a tour going out, you know, using the same amount, but you know, they, they, this stuff could always be found somewhere. Mm. Um, but yeah, they, they, they started off a tiny company. They became absolutely huge. I don't know if they're still going. I don't know. Interesting. And so far, as we know, it's the only uh, Media Lights maiden crew shirt or maiden shirt from them that we've uh, that's come to light. Never say never. There could be, you never know, there might be another one from another period, another tour that that, uh, that we haven't seen yet, but anything is possible in shirt collecting world. Oh, in the world of collecting, you <laughs> you think you've seen it all, you think That's you've right. got it all, you think you've completed it, and just, before, just when you think you've completed the set, someone... <laughs> yeah. someone posts something up on one of the groups or on eBay and you think, oh, God, this is never going to end. So speaking about the never-ending tour, let's keep going. Oh, okay, so back to uh, the extensive European, UK, and then more Europe uh, tour for the rest of the year. And this is just a simple, uh, another sleeveless shirt, white. It's just got the Eddie head from the, the front cover of the album on it. And a list of countries on the back, including Thailand, of all crazy yeah. places. 
And it's just a really simple but awesome, beautiful looking shirt from that tour. It's a and stunning. only available on the European dates. Yeah. The, the rest of the world didn't get this one. It is a stunning shirt. I mean, it's very simple, very very simple, but it's absolutely stunning. There's there's something about Eddie as the king of Egypt. There's something about Eddie in that Egyptian yellow and blue headdress. I just right. it, it just works on it works every level. Yeah. It's after, just after 36 years, I don't, I still love it. I still don't get sick of it. It's great. It's great. So late 1984, um, after Europe, they um, flew across the pond and uh, went to a very cold and icy Canada. That's right. So, so keeping with the uh, keeping with the sleeveless tradition, and you think this is like winter in Canada, and they're like making a sleeveless shirt for the, for the fans <laughs> to wear, you know? <laughs> Should have been a sweatshirt, right? <laughs> but uh, one of my favourite shirts of all time is the Canadian uh, event shirt, of course, featuring the uh, famous Derek Riggs uh, Mountie, Eddie is the Mountie artwork, uh, leading the moose through the snow. And look, personally, growing up with, with vinyl, especially in the mid-'80s, you've got the Live After Death vinyl, as a kid, this was just a dream shirt of mine. When you open up that gatefold vinyl, there's a big picture of Steve Harris on the left wearing this shirt. I know she's just to stare at it when I was a kid, just dreaming of trying to work out what shirt that was and how I could one day possibly own one. It's just a brilliant piece of artwork. You know? It is. It is a fantastic piece of artwork. And th again, it continues this programmatic theme of putting Eddie within the actual local culture of where they were playing and how much more Canadian can you get than a Canadian Mountie and a moose so right. I mean it's it's great now we should clarify something there there is um, amongst the fan base there there's been discussion that that artwork is actually banned or censored um Yes and no. Uh, it, it certainly wasn't banned in 84 because clearly the artwork was sold. I'm oh, sorry, the shirt with that artwork was sold at all the shows. It was only in later years um, that the Canadian government decided to ban this artwork because reportedly um, the Mountie sort of uniform was trademarked or copy, copyright. Yeah. Yeah, um, which I found interesting. Uh, Wardy, was that in the 90s or was that later? Well, I'm not 100%. I think it might have been early 2000s. When they released the uh, the reissues. The reissues with that specific sleeve, yeah. That's right. Well, they were Actually, released uh, and then they were pulled straight away pretty much. So. Just a quick question. Is uh, the plural of moose, meese? <laughs> Leave your comments down below the video, because <laughs> there will there will be so there will be erudite you got goose and geese. Yeah, I just thought no, 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 no. Look, this this is a very valid question, and there will be well learned, well read people watching this who will know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another interesting point about that artwork, obviously, uh, Derek Riggs painted that that image. Ah, yes. This would be the last time that a Derek Riggs full piece of artwork was used as an event shirt artwork on a maiden shirt. Yeah. And I think by then he, he was becoming so overpowered by the, like the amount of stuff that you know, the band were requesting from him. Yeah. In the end, he was, you know, you've you got to draw the line somewhere. That's right. And so that leads us into the next group of shirts we're going to talk about. Yeah. It's, uh, so the US event jerseys. So January, we're we're in mid January now. So we've had the new eighty four New Year. It's a new year. Um, the 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 boys only took really a week off, and here we are. US tour kicks off. Um, or actually, US tour already kicked off in December of eighty four. So here we are now, mid January eighty five, playing in one of their undoubtedly one of their A markets, New York City. Seven concerts, seven shows uh, booked at the legendary Radio City Music Hall in New York City. Um, 
which I mean is just in, insane. Uh, seven gigs there, and uh, what a shirt! Do you want to talk about the shirt, Matt? Absolutely. I mean, what a what a stunning event shirt. Again, it's like taking that event shirt um, quality to the next level. You got awesome front and back prints now, and the detail on these shirts is just astronomic. I mean, like you got Eddie standing in front of uh you know a drawing of radio city music hall with hundreds of maiden fans out the front and in the fine print you can see on the billing iron maiden and all the dates listed along the railing of of the radio city hall it's just totally awesome and the eddie that's used on there this is another amazing point in shirt history um was actually the eddie from the 1984 christmas card uh, which would only have been given to, again, band crew members, EMI staff, sent out as promo. So it wasn't it wasn't a well-publicised Eddie at all at the time. No one would have known about it. And the choice of whoever designed these shirts to use that Eddie, for me, is just awesome. Fantastic <laughs> choice of Eddie. Yeah. Yeah, this this is an incredible uh, shirt, actually, um, and and it's probably one of the more, one of the most expensive ones on the market, isn't it, at the moment? Totally. I mean, like vintage maiden shirts go for, all well, these jerseys go for well in excess of a thousand US dollars. <laughs> oh, God. Most of them pushing two thousand these yeah. days. It's just it's yeah. off the charts. Yeah, I've seen this uh, New York eighty five shirt for. To over two thousand US, US. I mean, it's it's just insane. And uh, this is where the famous uh, incident took place, where Bruce um, became very ill. Um, he got the flu, and he just could not carry on after the fourth or fifth night, I think. And um, they had to cancel the last two shows, and obviously had a a, a few days off after that um, before they they carried on. And um, very relevant to these times, he. Uh, Again, when you listen to the bootlegs of those shows, he he actually tells the first two rows to sort of step back and be careful because he's got the um the Hong Kong chicken flu or the bird flu, which was actually a reference to the nineteen sixty eight um, uh, Hong Kong flu pand uh, epidemic or pandemic, um, which uh, killed something like four million people at that time. It's actually bigger than what we're dealing with now, and the other thing I thought was strange, 1968 to 1985 was 17 years. That would be like us now talking about something that happened in 2003. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, time it's is a, how time moves there, isn't it? Yeah, it's, time is a weird thing. Time is a very weird thing. And yeah, look, these, these US shirts, um, I just love them, Matt. They tell us more about how Eddie was participant a willing participant in the local <laughs> local culture. Well, if we if we move to the next shirt, the uh, the Florida jersey, again, the the amount of detail on this shirt is just incredible. Front print, you've got Eddie, the main tour design Eddie, obviously Derek Riggs is Eddie, the slavery tour Eddie. Uh, this time he's chewing his way through Florida's Disneyland, the castle. There's a monorail coming off the rails. He's just causing havoc. We've got an alligator down in the front there. And the detail of this shirt is so insane that you can even see the individual bricks on the building of the castle walls. If you look really closely, it's just phenomenal. And the back print again, we've got the uh, the 84 Christmas card Eddie riding an alligator <laughs> <laughs> with the slogan, Arrive Alive in 85, which was probably the road safety campaign at the time, I imagine, something like that. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I think Wasp, um, Wasp also in their Blind in Texas video, again, it's really interesting what Maiden do, Wasp did. Um, yeah. They, on their Blind in Texas video, had a, on the, uh, at the end when the tour bus drives off into the desert, they have this thing, um, you know, don't drive blind or drunk or something like yeah. that. So I think it was a, a bit of a road safety message. Um, interesting. Cool. Hawaii. Hawaii 85, another another amazing jersey. Obviously, the front print is, if you're into shirts, you'll know that it's a rehash of the uh, the West Coast California 82 shirt. Eddie surfing a great white shark. 
on a huge wave. Obviously, this time again, Eddie's wrapped in bandages, and the attention to detail again is fantastic. You've got Eddie, he's got the flowers around his neck, he's wearing Bermuda shorts or board shorts, as we call them in Australia, and you've got the big exploding volcano behind him uh, for Hawaii. And obviously, like, first time, and it was the only time a maiden have mm. ever played in Hawaii. Mm. And what's interesting about this shirt is, is the back print on this shirt, again, totally Hawaiian theme she got floating pump uh, pumpkin floating pineapples the volcano again and you've got an original eddie picture here which we i'm unsure of who drew it it's a standalone eddie he's dressed as the trooper but he's wrapped in bandages he's planting a flag he's raising his fist to the air it's an awesome eddie and I just am not sure. I've never known who's responsible. If it, this artist was the guy from um, someone at Capitol Records or maybe Great Southern Merchandising or whether it was Derek's Eddie. We just don't know on this one. It was also used on the back of the, the California 85 shirt but with a California flag. That's, that's the only two times you've ever seen this Eddie. So a bit of a mystery there as well. If anyone knows the answer to that, hmm. tell us. No. Let us know. Absolutely. Now, the crew shirts um, are always interesting. They're, every, every tour, they've got some unique crew shirts. This one is one of the more obscure ones. The Killer Crew 85 is probably, again, it's probably the most detailed, the most full-on crew shirt they ever did. Um, obviously, taking the US tour, Eddie, again, and placing what I've been led to believe is Dickie Bell's head on the front instead of Eddie's face, and then a list of crew members on the back who I have no idea who any of them are, to be honest with you. We should, we should read them out. And, <laughs> well, we might have there, some answers as well. The, uh, the, the actual picture on the front, I'm not convinced that that is Dickie Bell. I'm, I'm not convinced. Um, the only person I could think of possibly would be Bill Barkley, but... I always thought it was Bill just because of the full beard and stuff, but... Yeah, but it, doesn't, it just doesn't look like him. You know, so I don't know who that was supposed to be. I mean, no, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure Michael Kenny did tell me it was um, Dicky Bell. There is a resemblance with Dicky Bell. It's just Dicky Bell had a characteristically sort of ginger moustache, whereas yeah, this never had a full beard. Never had a full beard. Yeah, exactly. This guy's got a full beard. The only person I could remember is um, having a full beard is, as you said, Bill Barclay. Oh, yeah. But I'm wondering, is this a motif? They've just mixed in elements from both guys and... Uh, yeah. yeah. It could be more than one. I mean, you know, they might have done it like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just in this shirt keeps the... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The last episode I was on, Looper, we did touch base with the 83, the hoodie, with the Killer Crew hoodie with the the, ro- the difference between a roadie and a, and pig, a pig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joke <laughs> on the back, and it has the same killer's silhouette. So it's a bit of continuity there between the the previous tour's Killer Crew version and the, the 85 one. So yeah. I like the way Maiden do that. They keep keep things following into each other like that. Yeah, there's, a, there's definitely but a they also, they also do, Especially when it comes to the, the crew shirts. They also keep it in house. Yeah. Now the, those shirts are not supposed to go out to the general public. Mm. Then, That's you know, right. Once once you actually own a shirt, you don't be like with it. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't have any of the old shirts that I have. I don't have any of them. But I don't even know what happened to them. Ah, oh, time. Uh, time does that to items and sort of makes them magically disappear. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm still looking for my signed poster from 1992. It's just, just one day it was gone. Um, <laughs> I think my mother must have thrown it out when I moved out of home or something. Um, so yeah, so we we are now up to April 1985, and uh, they've go from playing Hawaii from the very first time ever to a place where th- it was almost like their third home and that's japan a very very strong uh, fertile support for the band there um now matt there was a bit of controversy a while ago about whether japan even had a shirt at one point well there was, there was a bit of a threat among some of the older collectors <coughs> who, who had never seen this shirt 
therefore assumed that there never was a shirt. Can you imagine going to a world slavery gig at these huge gigs in Japan and not being any merch apart from a you know a square program? <laughs> but um, what's awesome about that this shirt on a blue blue fabric, it was printed by Udo artists themselves who were long time maiden Mr. promoters Udo in Japan and the, the biggest rock promoters in Japan's history, you'd have to say. In the mid '80s, between I think '83 and '86. <clears throat> Excuse me, Udo produced their own merchandise for their for their concerts. I've seen um, shirts from like Rainbow and David Bowie in '83 in Japan, Judas Priest in '84 and '86, all with Udo label. So they were obviously at that level of making their own merchandise in those times. And that, look back to the, uh, the debate we were having in the collecting circles. We finally got the providence of of a photo from Ross Holfen, which was backstage at one of the Japanese shows. And it shows Nico pointing down at the table. And on the table, you can see the Japanese program and one of these blue Japanese um, tour shirts. So yeah, it's a stunning really, shirt. It's a beautiful shirt. It's, it's a got beautiful, the, beautiful shirt. It's got that different shade of blue. And the Japanese tour dates are written in the Egyptian style right. yeah. stunning, sort of script. I love yeah. this shirt. Absolutely love this shirt, and and it was made by Udo Merch, wasn't it? Udo Artist, did it? Udo yeah. Artist, uh, and Loopy, you've actually had the uh, pleasure of having a massage from Mister Udo, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and steak sandwiches. Yeah, steak sandwiches. <laughs> um, yeah, when we arrived at, um, at the airport, we were driven in like what were like small minibuses to the hotel, and it is just one of those bizarre places. Japan is. When you've got um, the central reservation is completely blocked off, you can't see anything on the other side. All you can see are the tail lights of these millions of cars in front of you. <coughs> anyway, we got to the hotel and we were sort of rushed into the hotel because there were just so many fans. And of course, we checked in, we go up to the up to our rooms, we drop our bags, you know, get freshened up. And the first thing we were told was make your way down to the bar in the basement. Which is what we did. We, uh, we all sort of went down there, and uh, I was sitting in, in a chair. And Udo came in, and he'd, he'd, well, he'd basically he'd, he'd been in the room. He'd, he'd sort of wandered round, and then he came out and he went, "Loopy." I think, you know, "How do people know my name?" It's just like unbelievable. You know, I was well famous in Japan, so. <laughs> So while I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm actually starving, and he starts massaging my shoulders. And he leans down and he says, try the steak sandwiches. He said, they are brilliant. I said, I have two. He went, you can have as many as you want. And the more he was massaging, the lower and lower I was getting in, in the chair. And I was literally just sliding off. And we got falling asleep. But the other part of that was that uh, next to this little restaurant where, where we were eating was a, a, a bar. And it was a, um, the barman there was one of these people that would tip a bottle of beer in, into a glass and just tip it, and you know you get this huge head on it, and then you still got a quarter of the bottle left in the bottle in the bottle there. <laughs> so in the end, I you know because we, we were in this hotel for about three days before we even like, sort of went off and started doing gigs. So over the course of those three days, I actually taught him how to pour a bottle of bottle of beer properly, to the point where he got it. Down pat, I mean, yeah, it's spot on. But yes, Mr. Udo, what a lovely guy. Awesome. Uh, I'd, I'd love to meet you again. I'd love to. It's just amazing. Mm. Are, are they still doing, prom are, does Udo still promote in uh, Japan? Uh, probably not himself, because he was, he was fairly old. Back then? The chances are, yeah. I, was 30. I think the company, I think the company's still going. Yeah. yeah, I would have thought the company. I mean, they, there is only one promoter in Japan, that is Udo. Udo, yeah, and this was thirty-five years ago, so he'd probably he'd be quite advanced in age if, Absolutely. if still with us. And yeah, a month later, we got a chance to see the band. It, um, so we had the Australian tour, um, and this tour was um, unique for a couple of reasons. Mr. Ward, would you like to elaborate? Uh, okay, well, in, this, in shirt terms, um, 
coming from the vast array of American designs, they come to Australia, and Australia gets two designs. We get the simple tour ready and then the two minutes to midnight design, which you can look at the shirt here. Um, although it's a, it's a beautiful shirt, don't get me wrong, on white, it's, it's the same design uh, as the European tour shirt. Um, so shirt note fact here that the Australian designs were the bravado European designs, whereas the in the 82 tour, the Australian tour, the great Southern Co American designs were used out here. And it might not mean much, but to me it means that Australian 85 did not get an event shirt. I think if we had had the American Great Southern Co, uh, if, if that merchandising deal had, had included Australia, I think we may have gotten an Australian event shirt. Who knows what it could have been. Mm. It could have been Eddie ripping open the Sydney Harbour Bridge or something, something awesome like that. But uh, that opportunity was kind of missed and we just sort of got the, the sort of more basic designs. I Having think, said that, yeah. the uh, the tour dates on the back obviously feature the Australian and New Zealand dates, which um, New Zealand dates unfortunately were cancelled. Because of but, union yeah. union strikes, I believe. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah pretty crazy. And uh, the, the Australian dates on the back are not the complete dates that they played in this country. They did play two other shows as well as those bigger cities on the shirt. They did play... Of all places, Wollongong and Newcastle in New South Wales. Which yeah, is, uh, amazing for a band of that stature. Yeah, so for all our overseas friends who actually comprise the majority of viewers of this show, um, as in overseas, as in non-Australians, uh, Wollongong and Newcastle are what we call regional towns, and back in '85, we would have called them small country towns it would be tantamount to Maiden having played, no, I won't say an English village, but I mean, back in 85, it wouldn't have been that far off it. And, um, you know, these were industrial, small industrial towns, and the venues that they played in were pretty much the equivalent of what you would call an American diner. You know, so, <laughs> so there would be people there... Um, ordering food, waiting for their chicken parmigiana and chips. And, um, oh, look, there's Iron Maiden playing a show on the World Slavery Tour. So <laughs> It's unbelievable yeah, to think that, man. As yeah, we say, like six I've weeks earlier, they're playing four nights at this 13,000-seat arena, and then they're playing in, in Wollongong. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> with all the... It's, it's absolutely incredible, right? This is uh, the 6th of May. In Wollongong, the Shell yeah. Harbour Workers Club. That's, That's it. Right. The night, night before, or two nights before, they were in Adelaide, and then the following night, they were in Sydney. Yeah. The so, yeah. So the venues. I mean, Festival Hall. Uh, take, uh, take that sort of size of production. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to know how they did that. I'd love to. I mean, if there's any pictures out there, please send them. Yeah, in. there are. No, we we got the um, we actually got what's called the B production. So they so what you see on Long Beach Arena and Hammersmith in Europe was their full A production. Yeah. What they bought here, what we saw, was basically a small B B production. It was, you mean, they bought the little... Oh, you mean the whole tour? Yeah, yeah, because don't forget, I mean, they're playing, I mean, probably the largest venue they played was here in Melbourne, it was about 4,000 people. But then oh. the smallest venue they played was that Shell Harbour's Workers Club, which was, again, it was like an American uh, roadside diner. And then you've got... Well, that, that would have been the C production. Oh, that... <laughs> yeah, that's like... I probably would have rolled up in their tracksuit pants and played that. But And then... Yeah, and then double Z. Yeah. yeah, and then Adelaide, Adelaide's Thurbert and Theatre, which I've been to, is a... I mean, it's, that's, that's almost like a scout hall. It really is. It's almost like a hall. I've been there. It's um, That holds 2,000, and, and the roof's quite low. So the Australian shows basically had the B production. So there was no big sort of Eddie at the back um, at the end. Uh, they had the walk-on Eddie, obviously, because that's easy. They had the, the the Anubis sort of jackal gods. They had, obviously, the sarcophagus, few hieroglyphs. But it was only, you know, you didn't get what you saw on Live After Death. I mean, there's just no way, no way. But, okay. but dare I say, um, even in some of the um, overseas shows or the European shows in some of the really tiny venues, mm. 
I don't think they would have had their A show. I mean, Oxford New Theatre. Uh, I mean, the the theatre in Oxford only the, holds the one thousand. In, in the UK are are limited. Yeah. Um, let's go back and have a look. Yeah. So so well, it would have been um, Saint Austell, Saint 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 Austell, is it? Um, Saint Austell is actually quite a big venue. Oh, okay. Um, or was. Uh, then you got Oxford New Theatre. Um, I would assume Birmingham Odeon, they would have had their full production. New Castle City Hall. Yeah, that would have been the full production. Is it St. David's Hall in Cardiff, Loopy? Uh, yes. Again, big venue. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, basically all these venues on this, on this list hold at least three and a half to four thousand. Wow. Which, which is probably the biggest venue, which is equivalent to the biggest venue we had here. Where, um, as a and and on the other side of the scale, the smallest venue they had here was the equivalent of a diner with people ordering, you know, pasta and chips. So so. I mean, just going through the list, Hammersmith Odeon with a capacity of three thousand eight hundred hmm. is probably that's probably about an average. Wow. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know, the stages are big enough to actually put in a full production. Hmm. I'm not. I'm not saying like you'd, you'd get the uh, the legacy stage in there. Oh God no! Oh God no! God no! Out of squeeze, I think you, you might just do it. But um, but but this is the yeah. gen- but this is the genius of Dave Lights. He was able to create a, 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 a this colossal Egyptian temple that could and fit. It's flexible. It as flexible, flexible, that could fit into small yeah. small venues. Well, again, going back to what I was saying earlier about the um, like on the, on the first sort of metal for mothers tour that we went out and did, when you got these trusses that are all sort of ten feet long, you take one of those out. So instead of having forty feet, you got thirty feet, but the band can still play mm-hmm. in that space because all you do is splay the lights out. <laughs> so it, it's sort of hitting the, the sides of the stage. So yeah. All, all these lighting rigs can be flexible. Brilliant. So they um they left they left Australia sadly and uh, would not be back for seven years um, sadly. Uh, so yeah, Matthew and I missed uh, some couple of really big tours that we uh, would have loved to have seen. But anyway, so they go to roll on to the North American summer and uh, they play the US and. One of the sort of key dates that they played, which coincided with the end of the tour, was the 4th of July. Great shirt, this one, to commemorate the event. Another classic, yeah, classic US event shirt. Um, the, the tour culminates on the 4th of July weekend. And, of course, Maiden pull out the Independence Day weekend shirt. Uh, with, like, again, it's a bit of a pastiche, a cut and paste of, different eddy heads on drawings of like traditional uh, American marching band of drummers and a, a flautist. <laughs> and you've got, the, you've got the killer's eddy head on the flautist and he's actually biting through the flute, I think, on a close-up and he's wearing a headband in true 80s fashion. And mm-hmm. the other heads are, are from different... I mean, one of the heads is from another 80, 85 US tour shirt with eddy breaking out of, a, out, of a, out of a tomb wall. And... Yeah, that was the the very last tour shirt on the uh, on the US trip on the nineteen eighty five. Yeah, and um, uh, also to the 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 band who opened for them was Wasp. Um, at uh, so so the, the tour ended basically July the fifth um, at Irvine Meadows in California. Wasp opened for them, and interestingly, Wasp also had their own Fourth uh, of July shirt, which um, which had this very angry insect. Um, Sort of on the front, on, on the on the back, and the front had a. It wasn't uh, it wasn't a wasp, was it? Sorry, yeah, it was a wasp. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was a it was a hornet. It was, a <laughs> it was it was well, yeah, it was basically a hornet. It was basically a, a very angry hornet. Um, and uh, the front of that was the back back print. The front front of that shirt had the the well a horned skull with the U.S. flag on it. Here's a question: So, did wasp ever use a wasp? As an emblem of any kind, or was it? Uh, 
No, yes and no. Um, I'd need to check my facts on this, but that shirt was the the main piece of merch which they did use a, 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 an actual insect, an actual, wasp, an actual yeah. wasp. There is, I believe, uh, there is, I believe, a single um, where there's a, there's a wasp pictured next to Blackie Lawless's saw blade, but. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd need to check my facts on that. So, And by the way, Wasp Set, and this is what upsets me, Wasp Set was actually professionally recorded, um, uh, sorry, professionally filmed uh, on the 5th of July, and you can see them playing, and you've got Maiden's stage set all covered in drapes, but you can see the odd hieroglyph, and yet Maiden's set wasn't filmed. Um, so whether that was a management issue, who knows, but... Um, that was the end of the tour. Lots of fireworks. Oh, same management. Yes. Same management. Same management. Yeah, yeah. Same, man- yeah. same management. How could, you know, how could there be an issue? I don't know. Ch- chances are that was recorded but never released. Yeah, so they probably like, have. Like, all, the, all the shows that we see now, I mean, all of them are now recorded. Well, I'm sure it'll leak through sometime in the bootleg but, world. Yeah, again, don't forget, I mean, with the. Uh, the band getting very, very close to the end of their career. Mm. All these things are being stored up to be released at a later date. So it'll come out eventually. You would hope so. I mean, you know, for Chances those I will all be dead by then, but <laughs> well, I mean, for those of us who, you know, the, the, the bootleg collecting scene, I mean, it's exciting because every now and again, you get a gem that does get leaked and, and all that does come out. And, you know, you would hope that something from this tour, comes out because I mean I find it hard to believe again sorry to be sound like a broken record but out of 190 gigs to only have yes. Live After Death and um, you know there's got to be something out there there's got to be something well, out there. There. well there's got to be more than Live After yeah, Death absolutely so and we come to the end um, we come to the end of the tour and they had a shirt for that as well well sorry well, they had the, another the shirt, shirt sorry the last shirt we, I'm going to mention is it's an Ian Conference promotional shirt. We're not quite sure when the Ian My Conference was, but the front of the art, the front artwork is the original artwork for Live After Death, um, with Eddie busting out of the grave front on. Obviously, that was changed to the, the one we know and love. And yeah, so unclear to when the Ian My Conference was at an end of the year '85. Was it the, was it a start of the year '86? Was it an end of financial year, which would maybe put it mid-86, we're not sure. But uh, one of the things as a shirt collector you do is you try and hunt down um, vintage photos or pictures of the time to try and place shirts at that point in history. And the only time we've ever seen this shirt in a photo is of one of the guys from Saxon uh, wearing it. Uh, when the band was in Athens, 1986. So it's, it was definitely around at the time. But uh, again, we need to track down someone from EMI who could actually tell us what what the what the conference was and when that shirt was given out. Yeah, we need to work on getting. We need to track down some of these people and get them on the show if they if they're even around. So. Right. Awesome, and that was the World Slavery Tour, a very special time for um, for the band, for the fans. Yes, the and, World um, Slavery T-shirts. Were... Yes, it was the world. Well, the, merchand- shows, the merchandise shows. tells the story of the era, it tells the story of the band, So, um, yeah. which is why well, we... The shirt said I've, I've never seen. Uh, you know, I've, I've got to admit, I am extremely jealous. <laughs> Some bars of that there's gotten. <laughs> Look, but me what either. Am, what am I up to? I'm up to about 80... I don't know, 86, 88 shirts from, from this period, from, from the power slave oh. period. But, but I mean, look, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been sort of collecting on and off, um, you know, for, for the better part of three, three and a bit decades. And back then, I had no idea, no idea a lot of these shirts even existed. Oh, I mean, so, me neither. Yeah. It was only, I mean, yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd look at the catalogs of the rock, rock magazines and you'd see the sort of standardized, um, you know, versions, but it's only in recent years, just sort of like the last five to 10 years where, you know, the collectors groups have flourished on um, Facebook and online. 
And we've actually learnt about a lot of these shirts even existing. So you get, you get stuff like this. Wow. Oh, what? Now that, if you picked up your Japanese rock magazines like Burn back in the day, there was a whole section of mail order merchandise just available in Japan. And that's that's one of the designs they had, a power slave design like that. Fucking amazing. Yeah, that's unofficial. Incredible. Well, you don't know because, I mean, it's got official copyright on it. Incredible. And these right? guys were producing top quality merch through the 80s with official copyrights. So, yeah. And it was only available in Japan. So I don't know. I, I, I would say it is official. It was a definitely licensed for sure. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and for those for those wondering, behind Matt's shoulder is actually that that triangle pyramid shaped. Uh, that is actually that 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 yeah that triangle shaped poster. That's actually the Power Slave um, album store promo display. It's that's the Australian one, yeah, the Australian. Yes, it's like a hanging. It's got little holes in the corner so I could hang in the in the in the record store. Yes, and it's rare as hen's teeth, as Ooh. we say here in here here in Australia. I've Ooh. I've got mines in storage. Mine's locked up in storage. I uh, it's it's actually it's rare, a, as, it's rare as unicorn shit. Yeah, it's it's a hard piece to a display actually because you know the, a lot of them the 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 ends are frayed and that's right. Yeah. Off, so, but um, excellent. I'm not sure what to do with mine, so it's, you know. Well, you get in a frame, otherwise it's just going to go into storage somewhere flat, but it's triangular, so it's really hard to keep without getting those ends damaged somehow. The only way you could do that is custom frame it, and yeah. you, you're asking a framer to do a triangle custom yeah. frame. I mean, that is it just... It would look, it would look amazing though, yeah, in the frame. I know, I know, I know. I, I've, <laughs> I've looked at mine, and I've agonized about how to display yeah. it and and my solution was just to lock it up in storage because <laughs> that seemed a bit easier you fucking lightweight <laughs> <laughs> with that uh we'll bid uh, our dear friend matt farewell thank uh, thank you so much mate um it's been bloody awesome as always having you on and um we'll see you next time We'll see you, guys. We'll see you for the next time, mate. Yeah, we'll see you for the again soon. Cheers, man. We'll see you for the next one, buddy. Take care, and we'll chat soon. See you later. Bye.